Ellen Craft, 1826 to 1891. The slave who pretended to be a white master while cross-dressing herself to freedom. It's true, you can't choose your family and nobody would have ever elected to start life as a servant to their slaveholder father. But this was Ellen's bleak reality. Her keeper dad, keeper as in master, certainly not as in catch, was a rich cotton planter in Clinton, Georgia, called Major James Smith. Her mother's name was Maria, and Maria was the Major's house slave, not the Major's wife. Plantation owners sexually violating and impregnating young slaves was not an uncommon story during the years of slavery in the American South, and Ellen was most likely the product of such a detestable tale. The fact that Ellen was a constant reminder of her husband's infidelity had Mrs Smith forever feeling ballistic, and so she decided there was nothing for it but to send her away. At the age of 11, Ellen became the wedding gift to one of the Smith's daughters, Eliza, and joined her and her new husband in the city of Macon. When most children her age, most white children her age, were probably cheerfully pushing hoops around with sticks without care, Ellen had to take on all the domestic and childcare responsibilities of a busy household as Eliza's lady maid. The laws surrounding slavery were repellent, but the day-to-day -day reality for the humans stripped of all humanity, the enslaved, was worse. Later, Ellen would go on to describe how Eliza was decidedly more humane than the majority of her class, and extraordinarily, Ellen was granted small mercies such as the right to her own room rather than having to sleep on the floor or a pallet at the foot of her mistress's bed. Oh, and the exemption from rape and torture. Emancipation for Ellen seemed like an impossibility. Of course she wanted to tell her masters to put eggs in their shoes and beat it, but the slave trade was untiring and hellish and she could but merely survive it. In the early 1840s, she met the ducks nuts of a sunshine ray in her sombre world her husband and master plan partner to be, William Craft. A slave and apprentice carpenter on an adjacent plantation, William was born in Macon but had been split from his entire family when he was sold to a new master to pay the gambling debts of his previous. Ellen and William had each other at hello and wanted to marry as quickly as they swooned but the slave laws had different plans for their love. Slaves from different plantations were not permitted to wed and beyond that, if they were to have children, they would be legally doomed to the same fate as their parents. They too would become slaves. Hoping and praying that conditions would improve, Ellen and William decided to struggle on, unmarried, and wait for white people to locate and engage their damn brains. After more than five years of continued tumbleweed in that department, our schnookums couple could hold on no longer and ask for special permission to marry. The consent to do so should have been the start of their happy ever after, but it actually made them more anxious. The fear of separation was a daily plague. The conclusion for their lives together was callous but clear. The glimmering hope of liberty would only ever remain a glint if they didn't do something drastic. Much like their received stamp of approval to become Mr and Mrs, both Ellen and William had some sovereignty on their respective estates. Together they could pool their pint-sized privileges to overthrow the oppressors. William was allowed to keep a sliver of his apprenticeship earnings. Ellen's private room was a perfect stash spot and her position in the household meant that eavesdropping opportunities were peak. All roads were leading to an escape plot. Even when slaves weren't trying to run, they were flogged, underfed, overworked, tortured and beaten to death. Most fugitive slave stories commemorated those who had to claw and fight their way to freedom. But the crafts was unique in that they made a dash for it in public. In broad daylight, and travelled in first-class train carriages no less. At first, Ellen was too nervous to action their plans, but the laws under which they lived, existed, saw her not as a woman, but a mere chattel to be bought and sold, or otherwise dealt with as her owner might see fit. The only way she could take control was to gamble their lives. As a mixed-race, light-skinned woman, Ellen took advantage of her appearance and it was decided she would get out disguised as a white slave master and William as her valet. 
Ellen soon found an impressive backstory and threw herself into character as if it was press night. She cut her hair, learned to stride like an entitled Caucasian persecutor and took the name Mr William Johnson. Johnson was a popular low-profile surname but also used as a code developed by abolitionists to guide runaway slaves to safety via the Underground Railroad. She was determined to be free. It was illegal for shops to sell to slaves without their master's consent. Some did so not because they sympathised with the slave, but because the white word would always win over the black in the court of law. Going to different shops across town to evade suspicion, William managed to use all he had saved to buy a William Johnson-worthy outfit, including a top hat, cravat, jacket and tassel. Ellen had to do whatever was clever to avoid attention or questions. The pretense agreed was that they were travelling to Philadelphia for specialist treatment for Johnson's rheumatism. As Ellen couldn't write, slaves were denied an education by law. She wore a sling on her right arm so she might not be asked to sign anything and a poultice on her face to dissuade strangers from talking to her. In December 1848, their plan was put into action and the pair cruised out of Macon on a train to Savannah, continuing their journey via a combo of steamboats, trains and coaches. Their journey was by no means an easy ride. The stakes were... Read the rest of this paragraph through the fingers with your hands over your eyes high. At one point, a friend of Ellen's master, a man who had known Ellen all her life, sat next to William Johnson. Ellen had to feign deafness to put him off. What with a sling, bandaged up face like an effed up McCain potato smile and sudden outright hearing loss, you'd think people would give the poor man a break. In Baltimore, when the end was in sight, the pair were ordered off a train by the guard and refused back on unless they could provide sufficient paperwork to prove that William was Ellen's slave. Again, ailments won over and the guard eventually took pity on Johnson's walking wounded woes and allowed them to continue. Against all odds, they reached Philadelphia on Christmas Day. They were kept safe there and later in Boston by a number of anti-slavery society members who opted for deeds over words and changed history as a result. The craft story spread like a starfish, and they began to hit the papers and hearts and minds of millions as they joined prominent activist William Wells Brown on his abolitionist lecture tour. Even after all they had achieved, Ellen typically stood in the wings while William told their story. It weren't right or proper for women to talk to mixed gender audiences and so, once more, she was silenced. It is even widely believed that the book about their story, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, which became a major tool for propaganda against southern slavery, was a joint effort by the couple, but published in William's name only. Reprints since the 1990s have listed both of the crafts as authors because finally... The Crafts have become the most renowned and influential activists in the abolitionist movement in the US and UK, but they were never safe. In 1850, a fugitive slave law was passed that was out to recapture escaped slaves. William and Ellen became the top prizes for government and they had bounty hunters and bloodhounds up in their grill until the end. They found asylum in England for nearly two decades where they had five children and continued moving, shaking and influence peddling. But the crafts eventually ended up back in Georgia in the late 1860s after American Civil War. The slaves may have been liberated, but they were in dire need. The poverty and illiteracy levels were all consuming. And despite many setbacks and much opposition, the crafts founded an agricultural school for newly freed slaves, the Woodville Cooperative. On an 1800 acre plantation, paid for by their blood, sweat and tears, and helped along by their supporters. When Ellen died, she was buried by her favourite oak tree on the plantation. She was forever proud of her roots. Hers was a life full of confronting oppression with fierceness, and she dedicated it to anti-slavery activism. She defied the expectations of her race, class and sex by not only having a public voice, but letting it ring out loud and clear. She believed she could, so she obliterated it. Put that on a tote bag. <laughs>